Okay, so a very warm welcome, everybody. Um, uh, as you probably know, uh, for the last few weeks, we've been looking at this very rich symbol, uh, the mandala of the five Buddhas. Um, and exploring, yeah, not you know, their images, but, ex but there's a huge amount of dharmic content symbolized in each. So we've been exploring the dharmic content, what they can tell us uh, about how we can practice the dharma in our daily lives. And for the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at um, what is actually the east-west axis of this, because really you should imagine that sort of laid flat. And the blue Buddha down the bottom is actually in the east, so completely different conventions about what's where. We tend to assume that everybody in their right mind would assume that north is up, but say not so. <laughs> east is down and west is up in this convention. Um, so we've been exploring this east-west axis between, which in a way we could say um, symbolizes, if you like, the inner aspect in aspects of enlightenment. So the head and the heart, the sort of cool wisdom aspect of enlightenment symbolized by uh, Akshobhya and the warm emotional metta compassion side of enlightenment symbolized by the red, warm red light of Amitabha. So we could say that symbolizes, if you like, the head and the heart which of course are unified, but the head and the heart aspects of enlightenment. Um, and um, yeah, so last week, um, Bodhinaga uh, told us a bit, a bit about Amitabha and uh, talking about how um, metta, the cultivation of metta, can be a path to all the way, that takes us all the way to enlightenment in its own right. Um, and he used uh, he used a, a canonical text, a text uh, uh, taught by the Buddha called the Karaniya Metta Sutta, to sort of illustrate this. A uh, very, very beautiful text. <clears throat> uh, but this week, what we're going to do is move on uh, from the east-west axis to the north-south axis, which runs what we would think of as east-west. Um, um, so we're going to look at the east-west, uh, the north-south aspect, which... I think you could say symbolizes more the outer aspect of enlightenment, the way enlightenment has an effect on the world, um, the way enlightenment manifests in the world. So next week, Pradaya is going to tell us about the um, golden yellow Buddha of abundance and generosity uh, in the south of the, of the mandala. Um, Ratna Sambhava, born from a jewel, but the jewel as its symbol. And this week I'm going to explore the meaning of maybe what I think is perhaps one of the most mysterious of the, uh, probably the most mysterious of the five Buddhas, um, the Buddha in the north, uh, which looks like it's the east, uh, the, um, the Buddha Amoga City, the Buddha whose name means something like unstoppable success. <clears throat> and um, unlike Akshobhya, who sits against the clear blue sky of dawn, or um, Amitabha, who sits against the warm um, sky of, uh, of sunset, um, Mugga City sits against the mysterious black sky of midnight. <clears throat> and his body glows and glimmers with green light. He's green. He's made of green light. And green is the color of action in Buddhism. It's the color of action. And uh, his family is called the action family. Actually, the karma family, but what karma actually means is action. He's the Buddha of action. His, fa his family is the action family. He's the Buddha of unstoppable success, the head of the action family. Um, and again, unlike, say, Akshobhya, who, and, and, well, the other Buddhas sit immobile. They sit calm and immobile. 
We saw about how Akshobia sits completely immovable on a throne supported by totally immovable elephants. Um, well, um, Amoka City's throne is supported by strange creatures who are half man, half bird, um, sometimes called Garudas. Um, and sometimes these strange mythic beasts are also called Shang Shang birds because they are crashing symbols as they fly through the air. So um, here's Amoga City with some Garudas on the, uh, on the side there, sort of half man, half bird. Um, there he is sort of symbolically supported by flying through the air with those wings. Uh, and there's a modern version of what a Garuda might look like. Oh, no. Um, so, um, so Amoga City is um, he's not sitting still in quiet contemplation. We can imagine him flying along through the midnight sky to the accompaniment of crashing cymbals from beasts like that. Um, maybe not quite like that. It's a slightly heavy metal Garuda, actually. <laughs> um, but yes, he's sort of, you can imagine him flying through the midnight sky, supported by these half men, half birds, flying through the midnight sky, crashing their cymbals as they go. So he's not he's sort of waking everybody up. He's not really very peaceful. Um, and um, Amoka City's mudra, his gesture, which you can just about see in that one, is this very, very powerful gesture. You can just about see it in that one. You know, it's not brought out very strongly in any of those, but it's the gesture of fearlessness on the shrine. This really powerful gesture of have no fear, granting fearlessness. Really, really powerful gesture. Um, so he is also the Buddha who banishes fear, banishes fear and anxiety, who gives fearlessness. Um, also, as his name tells us, he's the Buddha of success, of unstoppable success. And if we want to be successful in the spiritual life or in anything else for that matter, uh, then Amoga City has got some vitally important things to tell us some vitally important lessons to give us. And the key, I think, to what he has to tell us um, is in his symbol, his symbol. Um, the Vishva Vajra, or the crossed Vajra. So a few weeks ago, I talked about what a Vajra is, uh, because a Vajra, a single Vajra like that, is the symbol of Akshobhya. Um, and I said that, uh, well, it's an ancient, very ancient Indian symbol, um, which is sometimes called a diamond thunderbolt. That, um, and, it, and it combines the qualities of diamond and a thunderbolt. So diamond, you can't cut a diamond. You can't cut a diamond. It's it'll cut anything, but you can't cut it. It's the hardest thing there is. Um, and... If you look into a diamond, there's this amazing clarity. And a thunderbolt, well, a thunderbolt is a lightning strike. So there's tremendous energy, tremendous energy. But it's energy that sort of breaks through any obstacle and illuminates. So a diamond will cut through anything. A thunderbolt will smash anything in its path. It's tremendous, tremendous energy. Um, so a, a, a Vajra is indestructible like a diamond and it has the um, energy of a thunderbolt. Um, so the Vajra represents energy, we could say. That's one of the things that it represents. So what do crossed Vajras, what does a crossed Vajra, two Vajras crossed, what is that saying? What does that represent? Uh, and we've got one on the shrine there if you want to have a look at it later. Um, I think we could say that it represents different energies that appear to be pointing in different directions, uh, but unified, uh, brought together. Um, 
and forged into one unified entity. So different, en different energies made into one unified energy. So the crossed Vajra represents unified energies. Um, it represents what we often call integration, integrated en integration of energies. I mean, the word integration, I looked it up, it's got a lot of different uh, meanings, but one of them is, um, the one that comes closest is something like unification. Unification, making into one, making whole, making one unified whole. And I think, I think, I'm not sure about this, but I think the word integration used in the sort of pseudo, well, not pseudo, sort of spiritual psychological sense, was first popularized, I think, by the psychiatrist C.G. Jung, um, who talked about it as the process by which we become an individual. We become an individual, he said, by integrating these different aspects of ourselves. Um, uh, he called it individuation. That's our goal in, 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 as human beings, what he called individuation, according to his, uh, according to his uh, ideas. And we do that by integrating, by integration. And Sangharachita, um, Sangharachita, the founder of our order and our movement, well, he saw integration as an essential part of the spiritual life. Um, so he talked about the five great aspects of the spiritual life. Uh, integration, positive emotion, spiritual death, and spiritual rebirth, and all underlied with receptivity. Um, so, yeah, so, um, and Burger City represents one of these. He represents that great aspect of the spiritual life, uh, integration. And as a bit of an aside, I think that we can match our five Buddhas to um, the five uh, aspects, I think. We've got uh, integration in Amoga City. We've got positive emotion in Amitabha. We have spiritual death in Akshobhya, the, the Buddha of the sort of cool wisdom. Uh, we have spiritual rebirth in Ratnasambhava, giving birth to abundance and pouring abundance into the world. And maybe we have receptivity in, um, in Virochana, the illuminator who sort of illuminates all. So maybe, maybe. Um, but certainly, I think we can say um, integration and Amoga City. <clears throat> so, okay, so what do we really mean by integration? It's, it's, you know, integ we integrate our different parts of ourselves. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, in our unintegrated state, it's as though we have several, maybe many, different people inside us um, who don't always agree, with different aims, uh, who get to rule the roost, as it were, by accident, according to uh, the state we're in, the situation we're in. It brings to mind the UK Parliament <laughs> at the moment. Um, that's a bit what we're like. Um, there's all these different people, and they don't agree, and they can't, you know, they, they've got different aims. So maybe when we're with our old friends, maybe our college friends, we're one person. Uh, then when we're at work, we're a different person. Um, when we're at the Buddhist center, we are really spiritual, and we genuinely are. We genuinely want to develop spiritually, and we are quite sure that tomorrow we are going to get up and meditate, get up early and meditate. Um, but then in the morning, we're someone else who would much rather lie in bed and have a, have a, a leisurely breakfast. Um, <clears throat> when we're with our parents, um, maybe we're sometimes a bit of a sulky teenager, or a rebellious teenager. Um, there's one school of sort of slightly pop psychology who say we've all got within us an adult, a child, and a critical parent who's always telling us off. Um, so in our inner cast of characters, we might recognize a critical Christine. And critical Christine always sees what's wrong with everybody, and especially she sees what's wrong with us. Um, uh, for her, nothing we ever do is good enough. Um, uh, she nags at us all the time, try harder, try harder, do better. Do better. Um, 
And then we might also have Soggy Stephen. And Soggy Stephen tells us to be kind to ourselves, self-meta. Um, you know, don't give yourself a hard time by having too much effort. Um, why not just stay in bed and then watch some TV? And Critical Christine and Soggy Stephen probably aren't speaking to each other. Um, um, we, we might have, ooh, what's me, uh, undermining Uther or something, who's, um, <laughs> who everything you think of, do, everything we think of doing says, oh, you know, it's not going to work. <laughs> oh, you can't do that. You know you, you know you can't do that. You, you, you tried something like that before and it didn't work, you know. Best not take the chance, best not take the chance. Uh, we might have ambitious Andrew, who wants to be a big shot and have respect and power. Uh, we might have uh, popular Penelope, who just likes to be liked by everyone and do anything that anybody else gets so popular with anyone else. We might have grasping Gordon, who is all about money um, and having more stuff. And we might have greedy Graham, who just wants more of anything that feels good or tastes good. Um, We might have adventurous Alice, who wants to experience everything there is on offer, and anxious Archibald, who is always worried that something bad might happen. And they're probably not speaking to each other either. <laughs> um, we probably in there somewhere got our mum and our dad. We probably sometimes think, oh my God, my dad said that. My dad used to say that, or my mum used to do that. Um, and usually it's a bit of a lottery. It's a bit of a lottery which of our cast of characters is in charge at any one time. Uh, some pop up in particular situations. Um, some sit in the background complaining or undermining. And some turn up as random moods. We just get up in the morning and find we're in a particular mood. One of our cast of characters is in charge. Just seem to be there. Um, so... If that's us, um, if we're in that sort of un unintegrated state, um, and we've got this lot arguing about what we should do and what's important, a bit like, as we say, our parliament, with no agreement there, one being in charge, one being being in charge one moment, a different one the next, it's not surprising that often our efforts are not very successful. We're trying to do one thing then and one thing then. That we don't stick to that. We change to that. There's a lot of self-undermining goes on. So, yeah, as I say, we're a lot like our present parliament. There's no majority for anything and no unifying vision that everybody can subscribe to. We can't find any way forward that the whole of us is about so that our life is not really about anything. Um, Lots of disagreeing, that's it. Um, so lots of different disagreeing people inside us, or sort of similar, but disagreeing. But it's even worse than that. It's even more complicated than that. Because uh, anxious Archibald and company, they're actually sort of like people. Uh, but inside us, there are beings that aren't really human at all. <laughs> So at one end of the spectrum, um, I think we all have, a, have within us a sort of divine, godlike being. A, a, a being that really belongs in a higher realm, who li loves beauty and nobility and virtue for its own sake and higher mental states, who maybe gets activated when we go on retreat and sometimes really shines through the rest of our personality when we're meditating. Um, who genuinely wants to live a spiritual life, to act ethically, to be altruistic, virtuous, noble. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, inside us, there are also some rather grungy lower beings who are really not much more than animals, who want what animals want. They want food, they want sex, they want dominance, they want comfort, and they want security. Um, and there's loads, and they've got loads of energy, a bit like Garuda's. Uh, I think the Garuda actually is quite a, a good symbol of uh, integration because it's part animal, part human. Um, and we've all got these loads of energies in these animal 
energies, if you like. These, these energies could be our servants. They could be our servants, but they're tricky and rebellious, and they've got their own agendas. And I'm sort of reminded of um, Caliban in, I don't know if you know the play The Tempest, but Caliban, Prospero's got this servant, Caliban, um, who's supposed to be a servant, but he's really rebellious, and he's, he's, he's sort of really... And he, he's got two servants. He's got Ariel, who flies through the air as a sort of fairy figure, and then Caliban, who's just there. Uh, but Caliban's often, you know, he's rebelling, he's undermining, he's trying to get his own way. Um, I was reading a book, actually, I think it's called Rialto the Magnificent by a, uh, a science fiction author called Jack Vance from ages ago. And uh, in this, he's got magicians, and these magicians control these forces that are a bit like some of these forces in us. That's how they get their power. But they're always trying to sort of sneakily get their own way. And it's a bit like that. Um, so in our introductory course, we liken ourselves, we liken our being to a horse and a rider, don't we? We say it's, it's a bit like we're a horse and a rider, and the rider is our sort of higher conscious self, if you like, the person we think we are, and we think we're going over there, but the we're actually going where the horse wants to go. The horse is in charge, and very often the horse is going towards... Uh, a full nose bag, a uh, comfy stable, or horses or, that it finds sexually attractive. Um, and we see that with a lot of people, that they've got high ideals, but the way they live maybe is quite different. So we talk about you know, the horse and the rider, and we talk about how the rider has got to get in touch with the horse and speak the language of the horse. And that sounds quite difficult, but actually, it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, it's even more complicated than just one horse and just one rider because the horse is probably several horses lashed together, all pulling in different directions. And uh, there's a whole cast of riders who keep leaping into the saddle and pushing the other person off. So how are we going to get anywhere? How are we going to get anywhere? Um, uh, if that's our situation, if that is our situation... Um, if that's what we're like, unless we do something about it, it's not surprising that Sangaraccia tells us that integration is an important part of the spiritual life. Um, if we want to be successful in the spiritual life, we need to get some agreement uh, among our inner cast of characters. That, that is our goal. And we need to get our horses, we need to get these lower beings on our lower energies on our side, helping us and not always playing tricks and rebelling. Um, and um, so... We need that in the spiritual life, but we also need, need that integration if we're going to be successful at anything. At anything, we need, we need to develop integration. <clears throat> so these, this unification of energies represented by Omega City's crust Vajra um, is the key to his unstoppable success. His energies are unified. They're running in the same direction. Um, and also, as I'll explain later, it's also the key to the fearlessness. Um, the three are completely connected. So why do I say that? Why, why do I say that it's the key to fearlessness, or at least a lack of anxiety? I think it's because a lot of our anxiety arises because we have no one clear purpose. So we never quite know, we're never quite sure that um, we should be doing what we are doing. Um, so when we're meditating, maybe we think we should be getting on with something on our to-do list. And if we are getting on with something on our to-do list, maybe something in the background thinks we should be getting on with something different on our to-do list that now suddenly seems more urgent. Um, or maybe we think, uh, well, I'm getting really dull, I should be out having a good time with my friends. Um, so there's always that sort of sense that, well, we've got too many, too many choices and no way of deciding between them. What is important? What's important? And then at the back of our mind, there's always a nagging, deeper anxiety. Oh, what am I doing with my life? What am I doing with my life? Um, I'm wasting this precious opportunity not doing anything important. And our higher self keeps poking us in the ribs saying, Get on with doing the thing you're supposed to be doing. Get on with what you're here for. 
Stop messing around. Stop doing all this rubbish. Um, stop wasting time. And we feel that poking in the ribs as a sort of constant background anxiety in our life. That, well, I'm not, I'm not doing what I should be doing. I'm not doing what I should be doing. Whereas if we've got a clear purpose, we know what we should be doing. And a lot of our anxiety just completely falls away. <clears throat> so, okay, so that's a bit about integration, integration of energies. Um, how do we know if we are unintegrated? Well, I think one of the things is um, we make resolutions and we don't carry them out. So we genuinely think, I'll do that, and then somehow it never quite happens. I'm going to meditate every day. Mm, then I don't meditate every day. I'm going to get fit, go running. I'm going to run six miles every morning, and then we don't run six miles every morning. Um, so yeah, we, we make resolutions, and we make them as one person, and we break them as somebody else. So, you know, we, we can't guarantee that there's that sort of thread of continuity of our character to carry them through. Uh, similarly with commitments, we make commitments, and then it seemed like a bad idea, so we do something else. Uh, I'm not in the mood. You know, you know, I'll do it. I'll do it some other time. I'm not in the mood. Um, so um, yeah, we we and we say we'll do things, and we don't do them. Um, so those those are sort of some signs that we're not integrated. But I think there's another one which I think is this uh, anxiety. Actually, if we suffer a lot of anxiety, a lot of unnecessary anxiety it could well be a sign that we're unintegrated. Um, <clears throat> so, okay, that might be a sign that we're unintegrated. I think we can probably all take it that we're not completely integrated, actually. So, you know, at one extreme, there's uh, complete, like, chaos. At the other extreme there is, well, it would be good to have a bit more integration. But we can probably assume that we all need to work on our integration. Okay, so how do we become more integrated? Maybe that's the, the real key. I think the first one is to make commitments. Okay, make commitments. Um, that needs a word of warning, because I remember, um, yeah, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll uh, put a caveat on that. Make reasonable, sensible commitments, okay? And I say that because I did actually say this to somebody once, and they went out and did something that everyone went, what? <laughs> and I went, I said, are you sure that's a good idea? And uh, the person said, well, you told me that making commitments was a really good idea, so I've done it. It's like, oh, my God. Um, so, yeah, make sensible, <laughs> considered <laughs> commitments, okay? Um, let's not live a life where we keep, we try and keep our options open. Trying to keep our options open is like trying to stay unintegrated. It's like saying, I don't know what my life's about, so I'll just sort of keep loads of bolt holes and escape routes and, um, um, yeah, I, 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 I just, you know, I don't know, so I just keep, keep my options open. And it leads to an unlived life. It leads to a life where we never actually do any one thing. We can only actually do one thing thing. The idea that we keep the options open to do 15 things means we don't do any of them. <clears throat> so make sensible, doable commitments. Um, and then keep them. And then keep them. Um, so, yeah, so um, if we so we'll say, for example, say we'll do something regularly. That's the best sort of commitment. Well, it's an A sort of commitment. I'll do that regularly. I will do that regularly and then do it. Actually do it. No matter what we feel like and no matter if we are not in the mood, just do it. Um, feel like and not in the mood means, yeah, okay, I'll take notice of one of these characters here. Uh, so, for example, you know, we say if you join a Mitra group, there's a commitment to go every week. You just go. You just go. 
Um, it doesn't matter what mood you're in, doesn't matter if it doesn't seem like a good idea at the time, what you feel like, you just go. And that is, um, yeah, if, if we do what we feel like, act as the mood takes us, we are the opposite of, of, of integrated. We're just giving way to whichever of our cast of characters um, happens to be making a fuss at the particular time. Um, so integration is about developing this ability to override feelings, to override how we feel, to override our moods, so that we are the kingdom, the, the ruler, and the king or queen in our internal kingdom, as it were. Um, we're developing a sort of thread of continuity that runs through our life. So there's actually something to us. We're not just this and that and that and that. There's actually a backbone to who we are. Um, yeah, and I mean, so what does it mean? Committing to... I mean, I put down here um, jobs, relationships, and places that I live. Um, I mean, I think that... You know, we may want to change our job. We may want to change a relationship. Uh, we may want to change the place we live. But we sort of do that as a considered decision. I'm going to change that. Boof. But if we don't make that considered decision, we commit to it. We commit to it. I'm going to put myself into this job and do a good job. I'm going to make this relationship work. I'm going to make this place that I live a good place to live. I'm not just going to camp here. Uh, that sort of thing. We can spend our lives sort of living what St. Rice calls a provisional life, where we never really, we never, you know, it's always never quite good enough for us. We're always expecting we're going to do something better, and then we don't. I mean, we may want to do something better, but let's do that as a sensible, commit, um, sensible decision, a uh, considered decision. <clears throat> yeah, so we need to learn to override our passing feelings and our moods to become the king or queen in our own inner kingdom, develop this thread of continuity in our character. Um, it's sort of spiritual um, bodybuilding. It's sort of spiritual bodybuilding. We're building a person here. We're building an individual. Um, um, I think, you know, along with that sort of thing about commitments, so keep making a point of keeping our word, I think that would be a, another, another thing. Committing to friendships, you know, we'll really make that friendship work. Um, so, yeah, so committing. Um, I think um, seriously, seriously um, consciously taking on the practice of ethics is another, another one. Um, when we take on to practice the precepts, one of the things that happens is we find out very vividly all the bits of ourselves that don't want to practice the precepts. Um, they suddenly go, whoa! They, they can be in the background. We go along through our life thinking, I'm a pretty nice chap, and I'm pretty ethical, or chapess. I'm pretty ethical. And it's only when we and we take on consciously to practice a thing, something like the set of the five precepts that we realize actually there are big bits of us that really aren't, that we can be quite selfish, quite greedy, whatever. So we need to find those things out so that we can make friends with them. Um, so yeah, practicing the precepts. Um, and then when we decide, well, I'm going to live by my principles, not by how I feel this, this moment, that moment, that moment. Once again, we're spiritual bodybuilding. We're building a person uh, here, not just a sort of set of conflicting, um, conflicting sort of threads. Um, if you can manage it, I think one of the things that really helps in this is a practice of confession. I mean, order members and people who've asked for order, people training for ordination often have a sort of uh, situation in which confession becomes possible. I really want to dis completely divorce this from any ideas from like Christian confession. Um, it's about um, getting your spiritual friends to help you carry through on your resolutions. Um, it's much easier um, if you decide to do something and you tell your spiritual friends you're going to do it. It's much easier to do it um, because you really don't want to tell them you haven't. 
Um, so it's like there's this sort of reinforcing there. And, it, and when we get what is just internal, make it external, that's part of, that's part of integration, I think. I mean, um, I'm, not quite, I'm not quite sure I can express this, but, but yeah, integrating our inner and our outer worlds is part of integration. So that's one thing, practice ethics. Another, I think, is practice meditation, surprisingly. It's a funny list, this. It's um, rather familiar. Um, practice meditation. So the mindfulness of breathing. Very, I mean, one of the things that happens in the mindfulness of breathing, we find out a lot about our mind. We probably find out a lot of things we didn't want to know about our mind. We find out mental habits that get in the way. We call them the five hindrances, desire for sense experience. Yeah, I'm always wanting the next nice thing. Ill will. Yeah, I, you know, I often sit there and get, remember my resentments and my criticisms of people. Uh, um, um, what else is there? Um, anxiety and restlessness. Yeah, I'm really anxious. Oh, my God, I think I should be doing something different. Doubt. Uh, is this the right meditation? Um, maybe I shouldn't be meditating. Maybe I should be a Christian. Maybe I should be a Hindu. Maybe I should go and make lots of money. How can I sit here and meditate? Um, who should I put in the metal bar? No, I don't know. Um, et cetera, et cetera. And what else is there? Sorry? Sloth and torpor. Yes, that's just, what do I call him? Soggy Simon again. Oh, this is just all too much effort. Uh, I think I'll go to sleep. Um, so we find those characters when we meditate. But more than that, um, so we find those characters, those sort of human characters. We might find some of the subhuman characters. But also, Sangharashta talks about integration with regard to the mindfulness of breathing as what he calls both horizontal and vertical. So a horizontal is like getting Soggy Simon talking to critical Christine. Vertical is like, ah, yes. I also have within me, uh, if you like, a godlike being, a divine being, a higher being. Um, and we can start to get a taste of that in meditation. We can start to feel, ah, in touch with something which actually is at a different level, actually at a different level, and also with energies that are at a different depth. So we get this, what Sangharachta calls, a vertical integration, if you like. And again, these are metaphors, but... Um, we start to experience aspects of ourselves that we would never, we don't usually experience higher parts of ourselves and allow them to have an influence on us. So yeah, the mindfulness of breathing is the one practice that Sangharashta really um, emphasizes as the practice for integration. But I actually think the, the Metabhavana also does too, and I think that's particularly true with... Um, the fourth stage, the difficult person. Because, um, okay, the world is full of people with a, who are annoying. The world is full of people with flaws, who could be annoying, put it that way. But some of them really get our goat. And why? And it is not uncommon that out of all the range of things, that flaws that human beings have, the one that gets our goat is one that we've got a bit of. So very often, the fourth person in the Metabhavana, the person who we really, really makes our teeth great, is a bit like us. Yeah? So in a way, what we're doing when we extend metta, even to difficult people, is we're extending metta to the parts of ourselves that we don't want to know about, which is the only way that we integrate them. So I think med meditation as well. And finally, I'd say having a higher goal, having a higher goal than just all the different, you know, making money, being famous, being popular, having loads of sweeties um, of one sort or another, <laughs> having a higher goal that transcends the goals of all these different arguing members of parliament. Um, yes, yeah, so our parliament needs a ruler who can be respected. Um, someone who is clearly has a higher purpose and is above the bickering, um, who, as it were, has that sort of authority that, come, that comes from, as it were, coming from a higher place. Um, 
needs a leader who can express a higher vision. And when we have a leader who can express a higher vision, the other bickering parts of ourselves can fall in line behind that. It gives them something that they can agree on. This is higher than me. I will serve it. And all of our different things can serve that higher purpose. You know, our ambition, uh, even our greed, all sorts of parts of ourselves can serve that higher, uh, that higher vision. So we need a king or queen in our kingdom who is recognized as higher. Now then, I'm go- what I'm going to say now is probably going to be deeply shocking. And I, before I say that, I am not a monarchist, okay? I am not a monarchist. <laughs> I am speaking mythically here, but wouldn't it be good if Britain, say, had a king or queen who everybody thought they're so obviously from a higher place, so obviously got a higher vision above the petty infighting of politics, who commanded complete respect, who could step in and say, stop being so foolish, you lot. What we're going to do is this. Um, And okay, I don't really want that to happen. I don't want, you know, Elizabeth to wade into Parliament with her mace or something. But I'm sort of talking mythically, and we, need, we sort of need that in our own lives. We need a king or queen um, who, um, who is pursuing a higher, higher vision, who is about something, who is actually about something worth being about, that is higher than our various conflicting ego demands. Um, And when that happens, then we start to get some of the unstoppable success. We start to get agreement, and we start to get some of the unstoppable success of Amogus City. And we start to get some of that liberation from anxiety and fear, which is fearlessness, because we know what we're about, and we don't have to be afraid of all the other things. We can put up with a lot when we know what we're about. So if we want not to be ineffective and anxious, not blown this way and that. If we want to be a real individual, we need some of the, we need to learn a lesson from Mugger City.